Bruce Canine Podcast. Hello, everyone. I am back, and welcome to episode 166 of the Protection Dog Podcast, where we offer an alternative to conventional training methods and philosophy. I'm your host, Joel Riles, and today is October 5th, 2023. The year is almost gone. I hope you've been productive this year. We're going to have a couple of good episodes uh, when I get back from the next trip on uh, planning goals, uh, working through issues um, when you run into roadblocks, things like that to help get ready for the new year coming up. Um, Tonight, we are streaming on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, and Instagram, and we are going to be talking about tactical decision making. Now, for the purpose of this conversation, tactical does not mean like military and law enforcement, although we will reference some of those things uh, to kind of help it make sense. But what I'm talking about is anytime you have to use a tactical expertise, um, and we'll go over kind of what some of those things are to defend yourself, your family, your home, that is a tactical decision that has to be made and we're going to go over how to make those decisions when do you need to make those decisions uh what are uh some considerations that you need to keep in mind and we're actually going to go through a couple of scenarios uh to help kind of hopefully concrete this down and uh, help it make sense to everybody so welcome to everyone who is on the live with us tonight as well as everybody who's watching this afterwards i appreciate you guys all being here tonight i have a wonderful whiskey. This was given to me as a gift by, uh, looks like he just popped on, Daniel. And he said this is his favorite whiskey. It's Hibiki Suntory Whiskey, and this is the Japanese Harmony. And it is quite delicious. I have been enjoying it. I try to make sure that my nice whiskeys, I only do one glass in the evening, and then I go to my other lesser expensive, not quite as nice whiskeys after that, because otherwise you're kind of wasting them. And so that's what I'll be enjoying tonight with you while we go over this. And uh, real quick, let's talk about today's sponsor. Today's sponsor is Fortress Canine. So at Fortress Canine, we build your fortress. We have personal, family, and executive protection dogs available. And basically what we do that's different from almost anybody else in the industry is we are training family protection dogs. That means this dog has been trained to live your life with you. They can uh, chill out in your home. They can, uh, they're safe around family. They're safe around other pets. They're safe around friends that come over and visit with you. But if you need them, they can flip that switch on and they can go full bore uh, aggression and violence, which we'll talk about a little bit about using dogs in your tactical planning uh, tonight. But then the rest of the time, the 99.9999% of your life that you're not defending yourself from a threat, they integrate well into that lifestyle. So if you would like more information uh, or like to find out uh, how you can make one of these dogs a part of your life, you can visit our website at FortressK9.com. That is F-O-R-T-R-E-S-S, the letter K, the number nine dot com. You can email me at Joel, J-O-E-L, at FortressK9.com. You can send me a text. Remember, do not call me. I have too much going on in my life to answer phone calls that I don't recognize when they come in. But text works great. And if we need to, we will set up a phone consultation and actually talk on the phone. But you can text me at 813-836-9244. And you can check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. On Facebook, we are at Fortress Canine Kennels. And on Instagram and YouTube, we are at Fortress Canine. Um, don't forget, you can sign up for our email list on either of our websites, FortressK9.com or K9Academy.us, and get all the latest updates, uh, get the early information before it goes out to the rest of the public, and uh, you can do that by just visiting either of those two websites, and there'll be a little pop-up that pops up, and you can put your information in there and uh, kind of be on the inside scoop. We are going to have a book coming out in hopefully less than a year, uh, but we'll be putting some of the Uh, drafts, some of the information out a little early uh, on our email list, as well as uh, when litters are available and things like that. So if you're interested and you would like to be uh, the first to hear about things that happen here at Fortress Canine, 
sign up for our email list. If you're listening to this on uh, audio only as a podcast, do not forget to check out the Fountain app. That's at fountain.fm. Uh, they're a really cool place. And it's also one of the places that you can exchange value for value. If you like what you're listening to and you feel like it's worth a little bit of money, you can send a boost and that uses Satoshis, which are tiny bits of Bitcoin. And, uh, and that helps support us. And we always appreciate it when that kind of stuff happens. And so real quick, our training story. So we were doing a demo the other day and I had a guy, uh, a volunteer that came in and it allowed me to run the demo. And one of the things that happened was um, our dogs came in and they're biting the guy. And I was able to actually start instructing the crowd a little bit in more detail on exactly how we use the dogs or how we might use the dogs because not every situation is the same um, in this situation. And one of the things that kind of just happened organically, uh, but was a great teaching opportunity was that we actually went through a little bit of what might you do after the initial bite, right? So after the initial conflict has ended, let's say this person came into your home, right? And you used your dogs to defend yourself. Uh, the person was like, okay, I want it to be over. You know, please, please make it stop. You call your dog off. You tell the person to lay down on the ground. Now what? Right? We're now, in most situations, we're probably calling the police unless everything is completely broken down, which I think is highly unlikely. So in most situations, we're probably calling the police. Well, how long is it going to take them to get there? Right? Are they going to be there in two minutes? Are they going to be there in 15 minutes? We don't know, depending on where you live and your situation. Uh, they could be there fairly quickly or they could be there in 30 minutes, right? 45 minutes in some situations. So one of the things we went over is being able to communicate with the bad guy, with the person that you just had to defend yourself against, get on the ground, turn your face away from me, put your hands and feet out where I can see them, right? If you move, if you get up, if you try anything, you will be bit. My dogs will re-engage with you if you do anything you're not supposed to. We did a little demo on how you might come up and search this person. So that uh, the full demo, it was about two and a half minutes long, um, is on my YouTube channel. I posted it this morning and there's some shorts, but there's also the full uh, length demo there where you, the dogs come in, they bite. I kind of talk to the crowd a little bit while they're biting. I call the dogs off from a distance. I put the guy on the ground and then we go through some of the stuff that you might do uh, while you're waiting for somebody to come in, right? How, you, how might you go search the person to make sure they don't have any weapons, that sort of thing. So if you're interested in that, go check out that video on my YouTube channel at Fortress K9. And um, I just thought that was a really cool opportunity and I'm glad that I had it. Uh, thanks again to Gabby. Uh, I'm going to get more. I have his business card, so I'm going to get his information and we'll give him some shout outs here in the next couple weeks on the podcast. Uh, he was a really great guy and I appreciate him volunteering. Uh, he volunteered all three days. Uh, of our event, and uh, he was a great demo guy for us. Real quick, what's new on the dog stead? Well, we have an intern right now. Her name is Taylor, and she's doing awesome, and we're really looking forward to continuing to work with her for at least the next several months. And uh, so wanted to give a shout out to Taylor. You've probably seen her in some of our social media if you follow us, and she's been doing a great job. And uh, the, the dogs that she's been working with have responded very well to her. She's picking up the skill set very quickly. And we also have a couple of other interns that are going to be coming in for shorter periods of time over the next several months. And we'll be sharing that with you guys on social media as well. And then the Self-Reliance Festival is coming up. So we are planning to head out uh, on Tuesday evening next week. So next Thursday, we'll have a pre-recorded live for you guys. And so uh, really looking forward to that, looking forward to reconnecting with people that I haven't seen in a while. Um, that is October 14th and 15th in Camden, Tennessee. So I believe tickets are still available. You can find out more information and purchase your tickets if they are still available at selfreliancefestival.com. Also wanted to remind you guys, we have some German Shepherd puppies, which they are beautiful German Shepherd puppies. Um, I, I've been negligent in getting as much information out on social media as I should have. So I'm going to try and make up for that over the next several days. Um, but it is a Maeve Riker litter. They're awesome, amazing little pups. And then we also have some German Shepherd, I'm sorry, some Dutch Shepherds and some Malinois. This was a Dutch Mally cross. Uh, I believe we have five uh, five Dutch Shepherd pups and four Malinois pups, and uh, they're already starting to be reserved. So if you are interested in getting one of those before they're gone, 
I am not planning another breeding with any of our dogs until probably summertime 2024. So if you're interested in uh, getting a dog anytime between now and then, this is your opportunity. Uh, don't forget, you can reach out, send me a text, 813-836-9244, and, uh, and we will get you set up to get one of these pups. They're pretty awesome, and I'm excited across the board for what we have on ground right now. Um, but we kept a lot of pups from our last litter because I accidentally sold too many dogs uh, too quickly. So we kept a bunch of pups from our last litter. They're all doing awesome. And, uh, and we're keeping a couple from each of these litters. And then that's going to be it until uh, at least summertime next year, maybe longer, but probably summertime we'll be doing another breeding. Uh, and then I'll just give out a quick reminder. If you're not on Noster, N-O-S-T-R, Noster, um, I don't know what you're doing. If you are upset about the censorship and different things like that that happen on a lot of the social media platforms and you want to get on a platform that you can't be removed from, check out Noster. You can find out a lot of information about it by going to Noster.how. That's N-O-S-T-R dot H-O-W. And um, you can check out, <clears throat> excuse me, you can check out Snort.social, Iris, Primal, if you're on your uh, mobile device on iOS, Damus, D-A-M-U-S, or Iris, and on an Android, you can check out Amethyst. Um, basically, once you get a key pair, you are, that's like your username and password. That's how they function and operate. And then you can move around on any Noster uh, supported protocol platform. And it doesn't matter where you are, it gets shared across the platform. And then these various different things, I use the word platform because that's what we're used to with Facebook and things like that. But they're not walled gardens. Like if you're on Facebook, you're on Facebook, right? And whoever follows you on Facebook is there. But if you go over to Instagram, you're not all your followers on Facebook. Now, some Instagram and Facebook are owned by the same place. So they kind of be like, hey, this person follows you over here. You might want to follow them there. But they don't automatically follow you there, right? And they certainly don't follow you on YouTube and on Gab and on wherever else you might be. On Noster, once you're there and people are following you, they log in to anywhere and anybody that they follow is automatically on that new, they, I think they call them clients. And um, because if you, if for some reason one of the clients decides they want to start censoring people, you just hop over to one of the other clients, all your followers are still there, all the people you follow are still there, and you don't have to worry about it. So it's a pretty awesome thing that's going on. Highly recommend you check it out. We're there, and uh, you can also give us some support over there as well by zapping um, little bits of Bitcoin called Satoshis. Don't forget, if you want to interact with us, Please put your comments in all caps if you want me to respond. Now, I will scroll through, um, but if we have active comments going on, uh, which we do sometimes, then I pretty much just scroll past the stuff that's not in all caps because I assume that's you guys talking to each other. So if you want me to respond to something at the end, please put it in all caps. And don't forget to smash that like, that subscribe, share this with your friends and family so that more people can see it. And with that, Let's go ahead and jump into tonight's topic, tactical decision making. All right. So we've already mentioned that tactical decision making, we're not using this to talk about military, although it applies to military. We're not talking about police, you know, doing a SWAT entry or anything like that, although it also applies to that. We are talking about how do you make tactical decisions to defend your home against a home invasion? How do you make tactical decisions to deal with an active shooter at your ch children's school or at your place of work, right? How do you make tactical decisions to deal with something like maybe a domestic violence scenario? And we're going to go through those in detail at the end, but those are the types of things we're talking about. And it's extremely important that these tactical decisions, as much as you can, are made before you find yourself in a situation. Because if you're trying to make tactical situations in the moment, you're almost always going to make bad decisions. And we're gonna go into that a little bit, like why that happens. And, uh, and then we're also gonna talk about what kind of decisions you need to be making ahead of time. All right, but it's extremely important that this is done before you find yourself in a situation. Because what will happen if you're trying to make these decisions in the moment and it, you don't at least have a solid framework to build off of, you're going to make emotional decisions. And an emotional decision, we've all been trained to make emotional decisions in tactical situations by stupid TV shows and movies, all right? And so a classic example of this 
is the bad guy grabs a kid or grabs, you know, the girlfriend or whoever it is, and they point the gun at them and they say, drop your weapon or I'm going to shoot them. And then what does the person inevitably do? They drop their weapon and now they're defenseless to protect the person that they were supposedly trying to protect in the first place. And the person that was in danger is still in just as much danger as they were in before, right? And, uh, and so movies and TV train us to make stupid emotional decisions in tactical situations. <coughs> Excuse moi. And that is why it's so important that we have these decisions made ahead of time and that we're also making logical decisions, not emotion-based decisions, all right? So why do we need to be making logical decisions not emotional decisions. What happens when you make decisions based on emotions and you have the wrong goals in mind, we're gonna talk about what those should be as well, is that you put yourself in more danger almost all the time, okay? So one of the things, if, if you're fighting a battle, right? You're fighting an enemy. So, so now we're talking about like a military force fighting another military force. If you can force your enemy to make emotional decisions, you can almost always dominate them, okay? So here's a couple of examples. And for some reason, I'm hopping around in my notes, but this just seems to be flowing better, so I'll go with it. And I'll just try and scan up and down my notes as we go through this. So here's an example of that. Snipers. Now, some snipers, um, when they're doing their job, they just take out bad guys, right? But if a sniper is facing an enemy such as a company size element, a whole company of people. This is so a company is between 100 and 120 people typically that just general out, you know, sizes of a company. And you've got one sniper team. So maybe it's a guy by himself or maybe it's a, a sniper and his spotter. If all they start doing is shooting people, they can create some mayhem in that situation. But if they can get that company to start making emotional decisions, then they can be two to three times as effective. And so some of the things that snipers will do sometimes is rather than shooting people in the chest or the head, right? And just dropping them. And now that person's out of the fight. They'll do things like shoot them in a leg or a stomach. And what that does, especially if they can get that person where they're kind of in an exposed area is they take their first shot, right? And let's say they shoot the guy in a leg. And it's in the upper leg. So he, he falls to the ground. Uh, he's in a lot of pain, but he's largely immobile, right? And he's laying out there where he could be shot again and again and again. And everybody else hears the shot and they yell something like sniper and they all try and take cover, right? Well, now that they've taken cover, assuming they have a general idea of where the sniper is, the sniper now has very few targets available, right? There might be a few people that he can you know start taking shots at. Um, but in general, most of his targets just went away because they all tried to take cover. Now, what the sniper can do is he can start trying to force his enemy to start making emotional decisions. So now their buddy is out there and he got shot in the leg and they want to go help him. Right. And so he just waits and he sees, are they going to come and try and help him? And maybe the guy goes, you know what? I just got shot in the leg. I need to get to a safe place, too. I need to get behind cover. And so he starts crawling to a place where he can get cover. And now the sniper goes, uh, 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 that's not what you're going to do right now. And now he shoots him in the stomach, right? Now now he's in twice as much pain. He's in a really bad situation. And his buddies are all going, oh no, our buddies hurt more, right? And they make the emotional decision to run out from behind cover and try and get their buddy and pull him to safety. And they run out from behind cover. And what does the sniper do? He shoots the second man. Now you've got two guys out there that are injured. And then maybe another person comes out and he starts shooting them, right? And these people are left in these situations, which is, these are terrible situations to be in, by the way. Uh, you can talk about them without emotion, but if you're there, it's an extremely difficult situation to deal with because your buddy's out there and he's bleeding to death and your choices are leave him out there to bleed to death or risk your own life to go help him. But if you start making emotional decisions, now there's two people that are bleeding to death. And now there's three and then there's five and then there's 10, right? And this is extremely demoralizing to a unit. And if a sniper really knows what he's doing, he can do this for very long periods of time and take out half a unit, half a company size unit. One or two guys take out 50 other guys 
and that unit is basically non-combat effective at that point, right? And so that's one way that in a military setting, you can use your enemy's emotions against them. Another way that we can use emotions, so now let's look at something like a home invasion situation. And people, let's say they're, they haven't done their proper reconnaissance. They haven't gone and checked out the situation. They haven't um, you know, looked at the environment they're going to be going into. It's just for the sake of this discussion, this is a couple gangbangers and it's an initiation for one or two of the guys. And it's like, you guys got to come in here and do this stuff. And they just randomly pick a house, that one. And it just so happens to be yours, right? And here they come up, they kick your front door in, four or five guys come rushing in the house and they've probably made a little bit of a plan for how they're going to do this, right? At least if they're halfway smart. And then all of a sudden, they kick your front door in. They didn't realize you have one or two protection dogs. And from to them, complete surprise, dog smashes the first guy in the door, starts ripping his forearms off. He drops his gun or whatever weapon he has. The other guys are like, holy crap, we didn't expect that. Right now they have a spike in emotions in this particular case is probably a lot of fear. Right. And so they start making poor decisions and at least for them. Right. So it might be a good decision for you, but a poor decision for them. They might run away. They might try and fight with the dog and start getting smashed multiple times. But all their attention turns toward the dog. Right. Which allows you, the person to maybe go grab a weapon and then add to your defense with now you've got your dog fighting, but now you can also uh, use a firearm or something like that to defend your family, right? And so you can use dogs in that particular situation to create an emotional reaction from the people who are attacking you so that you can win that fight, okay? So it's extremely important. I'm not encouraging you to be the bad guy to do the, the attacking, but in any situation where you're thinking there may be a tactical situation here that we have to deal with, it's very important that as many of these decisions as possible are made in advance using logic and reason, okay? So when you're making decisions based on logic and reason, one of the first things you have to do is you have to decide what is our goal? What is the goal in mind, right? Now, many people immediately will think, well, the goal in mind is uh, I wanna protect my family or I wanna protect myself. Now, there's a few situations where that should be the priority, such as an active shooter situation, right? Get to safety. But if you're in a home invasion situation and your primary goal is to save your family and let's say they grab one of your children, right? And they threaten one of your children. If your primary goal is save my family and one of your children are being threatened by being killed or maimed, right? You may make the decision to put your guns down or to put whatever defensive options you have to remove those. And now you're helpless. Now, the question is, did that actually help your family, right? And if you're trying to make the decision in the moment with emotions, you may make the decision to give up your weapons. If you made logical decisions using uh, reason in advance, and you say, my primary goal is not to save my family. My primary goal is to end the threat, to make the area safe again. Now, if they grab your child, and let's say they're holding a knife to your child's neck, right? But you have a firearm. Now you can say the most logical thing to do in that situation is take careful aim and pull the trigger. Because you might maybe injure your child. The person might maybe injure your child if that happens. But the threat will almost certainly end if you're competent with your firearm. Right. And so if your goal is to end the threat, you can make good tactical decisions that keeps everyone else safe because you don't have just one person to worry about. You have your whole family to worry about. Right. And so now I'm not saying that save your family is a bad goal, but I'm saying you have to make the proper goals so that the overall situation plays out to your advantage. Right. So when you're making these decisions in advance, you, you might start with, my goal is to save my family. And then you need to start asking yourself questions. Well, what if this happens? What do I do? What if that happens? What do I do? So ultimately, if my goal is to end the threat and I make my tactical, logical, reasonable decisions 
based on ending the threat, ultimately I am saving my family, or at least I'm giving myself the best opportunity to save my family. I'm making the best decisions to save the most people in my family, right? But if my primary goal is to save my family and let's say shooting starts, and let's say it's you and your husband or you and your wife, and one of them gets shot. And for the sake of this particular situation, we'll say they get shot in the arm, right? And they you know, begin screaming because getting shot in the arm hurts. And they're like, ah, oh, you know, and they maybe fall to the ground or, or they, you know, now they're not using their weapon. Their, their other hand is trying to protect the, the injury that they've just received. And all of your attention goes to that person to try and help them. Now what happens? Now there's a much higher likelihood that you will also be shot, right? Because you've turned your attention off of the threat and onto this person who you love, who you don't want to get hurt, who you don't want to die. But because I had the wrong goal in mind, my goal wasn't make sure this threat is over. Now I've made a decision that puts them at more risk, puts me at risk, so now I may not be able to protect them because I might get injured too. And if you have children or anything else like that, puts all of them at risk as well, right? If the goal is to end the threat and the person that is fighting with you, your husband, your wife, maybe an older child, something like that. If they get hurt and you stay focused on ending the threat, once the threat is over, I can go and help them right? I might also start making decisions in advance like, hey, maybe we should all learn how to apply a tourniquet to ourselves so that if you get shot and you're bleeding from your arteries, you can stop the bleeding yourself while I go in the threat and then I will come and check on you when it's over. Does that make sense? So over-focusing on every little individual thing that might happen along the way puts you and everyone else at higher risk. Focusing on the threat, ending the threat, keeps everyone else as safe as I can keep them if this situation has occurred. Does that make sense? So these situations are never ideal. There's never a, oh, everything's just gonna work out wonderfully, right? These situations are always messy. And that that's the problem with making emotional decisions is if, I am trying to have a military objective and I make the ultimate goal. Nobody dies. If that's my goal, then you know what my decision is going to be? We are not going to go and fight that enemy in that spot. Because if I go fight that enemy in that spot, somebody might die. Right. But what if it's the Nazis in World War II and they're taking over the whole world and we need to get a foothold in Normandy so that we can get to Germany and stop this conflict. Well, then if my objective is nobody dies on Normandy, we're going to lose the war. If my objective is we overwhelm the enemy so that as few people die as possible, but we obtain the objective of getting that foothold so that we can get to Germany so we can end this war, people are going to die probably in those situations. But we're going to achieve the goal of the whole world doesn't turn into Nazis. Does that make sense? So you have to have your goals properly set so that you can save as much of your family as possible so that you can be as safe as possible, right? But the as possible comes in when you have the proper goal and the proper goal most of the time is end the threat. Now we're going to talk about a couple of exceptions to that because there's always exceptions to every rule, including tactical rules, but we're going to make it as safe as we can in a situation that's already very unsafe. Because if somebody's attacking you, you're already very unsafe. So you want to end the threat so that we return our environment, our immediate environment to safety as quickly as possible. And then we can check on everyone and then we can deal with any injuries and then we can do all the stuff that we need to do to make our people as safe as we can make them, right? We call 911, we do all those things. All right. So the decision making has to be done prior to the situation. We've already talked about if you're trying to make emotional decisions, you probably make poor decisions. But we also need to briefly touch on the physiological and cognitive physiological, meaning your control over your body and cognitive being your ability to think and process information effects of stress. So in a fight, you are going to be highly stressed and a couple of things happen 
when you are highly stressed. So physiologically, you lose a lot of your fine motor skills, right? Physiologically, you may have auditory exclusion, which means your ears basically just shut, shut off. Your body goes, don't need that right now. Shut it down. Take all that power that we have in our brain and put it toward physical activity. Okay. You might have tunnel vision. Lots and lots of people experience tunnel vision, right? And depending on how high the stress is, it might be like looking through a straw. Okay. So picture, take a straw, hold it up to your eye, close your other eye and go, that's all I can see, right? Under high stress, that might be what you experience. You might have fast motion time, which basically what that means is your brain shut down and everything happened and you didn't do anything, and then your brain goes, okay, I guess it's over, assuming you didn't die, and then your brain comes back on, and you go, wow, that was fast, right? But that, what that meant was you didn't do anything. You just froze in place. You might have slow motion time. Now, slow motion time is usually a big benefit in a tactical situation. That What usually happens to me under high stress is I get slow motion time. But the first time it happens, if you don't know that it can happen, that can be highly stressful too. It can like double your stress because you get stressed, you start to try and react and it's like, I'm trying to do this thing, but I'm moving in slow motion time. But if you understand slow motion time happens for some people and it happens, you go, wow, this is awesome. Like I can think through, I can look around, I can take in way more of my environment and what's going on and I can make decisions as I'm going and I just understand this is what's happening to me right now. Things didn't actually slow down. You're just processing information way faster in these situations. So it's important to be aware of those things, but your ability to think in the vast majority of these situations pretty much goes out the window. And so what do you do, right? The army used to have a saying, which didn't make sense to me for a long time, is uh, you always, what, how did it go? I'm trying to get the wording right here. You always default to your lowest level of training, okay? And so what that means is if you have to think about doing a thing, you won't do it under stress, right? You have to train a thing that you're going to do so that you can do it without thinking about it. And technically that means you're doing it subconsciously. So you've trained your subconscious. I have numerous episodes on this, on how to train your subconscious, on how to use scenario-based mental training, on how to do real world training, on the physiological and cognitive effects of stress. So if you're interested in delving into that more and you haven't heard those episodes, go back and check them out. But if you haven't made these decisions in advance, and then trained your subconscious to do them without having to think about it, then you're probably not going to do anything, right? Or the things that you do are gonna be not well thought through, okay? Which means that your chances of success are much lower, your chances of failure, your chances of family and friends and yourself getting injured or killed are much higher. And so we want these decisions to be made in advance and then we want our subconscious to have them ingrained in it so that it just automatically does the thing that we want it to do, right? And then the little deviations from whatever our scenarios were in our mind or in our training that we actually did, the little deviations, we can adjust for those because we have most of it already figured out, right? In the army, we call these TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures. Now they change from time to time, Right. And depending on the environment, and the situation, some things change frequently, some things change very slowly. But there's a certain way that we train to clear a building. Right. And if you're going to clear a building, you have to approach the building. You have to enter the building and then you have to go room by room. You have to deal with hallways and rooms and furniture and all sorts of things like that. And you, you do, there's tactics, techniques and procedures we use to do that. And then we practice them over and 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 over again until we can do it without thinking about it. Right. And when you make a mistake and somebody gets shot in training, then we go, what was the mistake? What did we do? What were we supposed to do? What happened? How can we change this so that that doesn't happen again? Right. And sometimes there's not anything you can do. It was just a good ambush was set up. Right. But a lot of times it's like, oh, if I had done this, which is usually in the tactics, techniques and procedures, I just didn't do it. Then I probably wouldn't have gotten shot 
or if I did did get shot, I would have been able to shoot the other guy too. And if I was wearing body armor, I'm probably still in the fight, right? Things like that. So you want to get these tactics, techniques, and procedures. You don't have to call them that, but you want to make these decisions in advance and then train your subconscious to do them so that in the moment, in the fight, in the tactical situation, you do the things that you need to do and you don't have to think about them. You've already made those decisions. There's no decisions to be made on those big things. And then it's only the deviations off of those that we have to make decisions on. And then our chances of success are much, much higher. Okay, so what are some of our tactical options? Now, I'm not gonna be talking about techniques for clearing rooms and all of that kind of stuff. I'm talking about big picture stuff here. And then you can go get training or you can do more research and things like that and, and get the, the fine details of how to do these things. But our big picture tactical options, primarily there's three of them. I started working out again and I'm more shaky over the last couple of days. I'm trying to take my drinks and my hands shaking as I'm coming up. <laughs> Am I getting old? I asked my mom that and I'm, I'm like, I'm always shaking. She's like, you've done that since you were a teenager. I'm like, oh, okay. So I guess it's just me. All right. So big tactical decisions. Number one, evasion and escape. So now we talked about our goal is not to save our family, right? Our goal is to end the threat, but there are several ways that we can end the threat. One of the things I tell my clients when we're I'm training them with dogs, as I said, now you have a protection dog, right? And I, I tell all my clients this, even if they don't have a protection dog, but you have a dog, right? And if you're going to move in public with your dog, you control your space. Now, for me, I generally think of that in public as I use six and seven foot leads. So the length of my lead around me in a circle, that's my space. I control it, right? Now, you might think, oh, if somebody comes into your space, you're just going to boss them around and tell them what to do right? Well, no, because you often can't just boss people around and tell them what to do. Now, sometimes you can be like, you need to do this to somebody in public and they'll do it, right? So like if I go to a restaurant and I have a limited space to move through and it's a dog friendly restaurant and they've got a dog that looks like it's not very well contained, right? They're not controlling it very well. I will stop outside where they're not in my space yet. And I will say, would you mind getting your dog under control for me, please? Right. And so I'm controlling my space. So when we're talking about evasion and escape, one of the options we have is we can take our space and we can move it away from the threat. Right. So let's talk about how this might work for evasion and escape in a couple situations. A home invasion. Right. One of your options in a home invasion is let's say it's at night and Everybody is in their bedrooms asleep, but they're all the bedrooms are together in this particular house, right? Because the way houses are laid out, they're usually not laid out for tactical options, but that would be like an ideal situation. Mom and dad's room, and then like two or three other bedrooms with the kids in it, and the main entry points are on the other end of the house. And, uh, and so from a tactical perspective, that's generally a pretty good situation. And so I hear somebody come in my front door, right? Maybe they kicked it in, maybe I, they, they picked a lock, maybe they broke a window, right? Whatever it was. I hear somebody come in and I'm like, I am not equipped to fight. So if that's, if that's the situation you find yourself in, I'm not equipped to fight. So I wake up, I quickly run quietly to each room. I gather all the children together and we go out one of the kids windows and we run to the neighbor's house and we call the cops from the neighbor's house, right? We won that fight. The person might've still gotten in the house. Maybe they're just stealing things. Maybe they were there to do bad things to us, right? We don't know but we evaded and we escaped and we called the cops and the cops came and checked the house and maybe they were there and they caught them. Maybe they'd already left. But in any situation, I didn't have to fight because I controlled my space by moving my space away from the threat. And when that's an option, that is usually your best option, right? So it's okay to run away as long as running away doesn't put you at more risk. Now, times that it's not a good idea generally to run away. If I have the ability to fight, I have the tools at my disposal to fight with, and a person pulls out a gun and points it at me, if I just turn and try and run away, right, and it's obvious that their intent is to shoot me, 
I'm probably at more risk trying to run away while they're shooting at me and shooting me in the back, right, while I'm running, than if I were to engage that threat and go full on aggression and fight with them. So sometimes evasion and escape is the best option. And when it's a good option, it's usually the best option. And sometimes it's not a good option and it puts us at more risk to attempt to evade or escape, right? And um, the next one is de-escalation. So times that de-escalation might be a good thing. Let's say that you're a single female or you're a female, and but you're by yourself. And you're walking in a parking lot late at night and somebody starts to follow you right? And you, you start, let, let's change the situation a little bit because um, that may be a situation where we, we use other things. Okay. So I'm a guy and I'm at a bar, but I haven't been drinking. I'm the designated driver tonight. So I, I'm thinking clearly, right? And I'm at a bar and a, another guy starts hitting on my wife, which if you're at a bar with your wife and other people are drunk, you probably already made some bad decisions, but let's just say I find myself in this situation. And um, I can see, I could either escalate this situation or I could de-escalate this situation. Now, sometimes I may attempt to de-escalate and it just doesn't work, right? But if I can de-escalate the situation, that is a good tactical option if I can do it successfully. So in the police force, when I was a sheriff's deputy, we used to call this verbal judo. And I'm pretty good at verbal judo. When I was a sheriff, I averaged about 17 arrests a month. And we worked what was called a Panama shift. So I worked 17 days a month. So while I did not have an arrest every night, some nights I would have multiple arrests and then other nights I wouldn't have any. But when I made my arrests, I never had to fight someone. Now, I wasn't a police officer for 20 years. Um, I was a police officer for a couple of years, but I never had to fight to arrest someone. And I had numerous people who, when it became obvious to them, that they were about to get arrested, they got very aggressive, right? And they were like, oh, you're not arresting me. And I was always able to talk to them and to basically explain to them that it was not a good option for them to fight. Now, if they had just attacked me, then I would have fought back. But if I can avoid a fight, right? We win every fight we don't have. So if I can avoid the fight, I want to avoid the fight as long as that doesn't put me in a worse situation than having the fight would have put me in. Give me one second. My daughter accidentally let a puppy in. So there you go, baby. Thank you. And we have a female that just had a spay. And so she's recovering from her surgery. We don't want puppy jumping all over her and messing with her. All right. So they're over there dealing with looks like a chicken and a puppy. All right. So, um, so de-escalation, right? This is another situation why it's so important not to make the emotional decision to decide in advance what you're going to do, because most escalation happens because we start to get emotional, right? You're a dude and someone hits on your wife or girlfriend. You're a woman and someone threatens your child, right? These things are emotional things. They create emotional responses in us. And if I haven't already decided how I'm going to engage in that situation, that I'm going to have the emotional response. And the emotional response is usually not the best tactical response, which either puts me in a bad situation now, or even if I win the fight, it could put me in a bad situation in what I like to refer to as the fight after the fight. So let's say you're a dude and you're in the bar and this happens. Some dudes come up, start hitting on your wife. And instead of de-escalating, you escalate because you're mad because somebody's hitting on your girl, right? And I escalate the situation and I end up in a fight, but I win. In fact, I kicked their asses. They're on the ground unconscious. And because I was so pissed and it was two against one, I knocked one of them on the ground and skull stomped him. And now he's got brain damage and he's in a coma in the hospital. That's a bad situation to be in, in the fight after the fight. But now I'm trying to justify why I skull stomped this drunk dude while I was sober and all he was doing was hitting on my girlfriend. Bad situation to find yourself in. So I won the fight in the moment and I'm probably going to jail for a long time because I lost the long-term fight, the fight after the fight, because I made an emotional decision, not a tactical decision, right? So if I can de-escalate, 
right? And sometimes that de-escalation is swallowing your pride. Fuck, baby. It's okay. I bet you saw the puppy go away. It's okay. Relax. Good place. So I might have to swallow my pride and just go, come on, baby. Let's leave. Right? And that might hurt as I'm walking out and the dudes are like, pussy and yelling all whatever kinds of things they might yell at me to make me like want to come back. Right. And I might want to like, Oh, no way, man. I'm a big, strong guy. I'm going to do this stuff. But then I go back in and I fight and then I lose the fight after the fight. Right. So de-escalation is a good tactical option when it's an option. And that's important about both these first two options, evasion and escape and de-escalation. They are better options than fighting when they're options but they're not always options. But the actual fight, so what I call aggressive defense, fighting, because you shouldn't be the one starting the fight, right? In a defensive situation, I might be the first one to hit, but I better not be the one that started the situation. And so if I can evade or escape, or if I can de-escalate, then the fight never happens. The actual physical fight never happens, and I win. I can swallow my pride, and I can win. I can remove myself from a situation and I can win because I didn't have to deal with the situation physically and I didn't have to deal with the fight after the fight and defend myself in front of other people who might decide you're going to go sit in a box for a number of years because you were a naughty boy, right? And so those when those are options, they are better options. Okay, but then aggressive defense. Sometimes those are not options. Right. If you're watching TV with your family and six dudes kick your front door in or even worse, you didn't have your doors locked and they just opened the door and walked in and you didn't have a way to defend yourself, then you're in a really bad situation. If you do have a way to defend yourself and you use it in that moment, de-escalation is not an option. Right. You're not going to stand up and go, ho, 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 guys, let's think about this reasonably. Come on now. Maybe this isn't the best decision, right? They've already decided we're coming in and we're doing bad stuff to people. So de-escalation is not an option. We're in our kitchen or we're in our living room and the front door to our house is in the living room and that's where they're coming in. Evasion and escape, at least for most of us, is not an option. Now, you might have a situation where you make the plan, the tactical plan, children, you go here right? And maybe you have an older child and you're like, you're responsible for getting the kids and getting them here. And so as many kids as they can, they escape and evade. And me and maybe an older child or me and my wife or whoever it is in your tactical plan, we will fight, right? We'll create the distraction and we'll slow them down. You guys get away. And so it might be evade and escape for some, fight for others. Okay. And so sometimes these things are mixed up in these situations. So let's go over making some plans in specific situations. So a home invasion, we're already talking about home invasion. First of all, when we start talking about home invasions and we start thinking about tactical decision-making, tactical decision-making is not just about the fight, okay? Whether you're shooting, whether you're fighting with your hands, whether you're using weapons, whatever it is, tactical decision-making starts before the fight even started, okay? So we've got a couple things to consider. Number one is deterrent. So we can make our house look like a hard place to attack. We can do that by having fences. Fences are great because I can lock my fence. And in order to get through the fence, you have to come over the fence, right? Which it might not slow people down too much, but it might slow them down a little bit. And if there's house with a fence, house with no fence, maybe I choose the house with no fence, right? We can put up, I have an alarm system, whether you do or don't. You can put that up and people go, oh, they've got an alarm. Next door neighbors don't have an alarm. Let's go there instead. I can put up cameras. Even when the cameras aren't connected, a lot of people will avoid going a place where they're going to be on film rather than a place that doesn't have cameras. Right now, if you're going to have cameras in general, I'm a proponent of if you have a gun, it should be loaded. If you have a protection dog, it should be trained to actually protect, not just bark right? That's an unloaded gun. You can, they can bark and maybe the person won't come in, but maybe they will. And if they do, and the dog tucks tail and runs, I'm in trouble. If they attack me when I have my gun and I pull the trigger and there's no bullets and it just goes click, then that's bad, right? If I have a camera and the person decides I don't care, 
right? Even if the fight happens, if I have the person on camera and I can go, here they are, this is their face. Take a screenshot of this. And when you put out your bolo, for which is be on the lookout for this person, you actually have an image to go with it, right? And so I'm a, I'm a proponent of that. But even if you don't have it connected, it's a deterrent, right? So the tactical decision-making starts with, number one, deterrence. Make yourself look like a hard target. Number two is actually having defense. So if you have a, a fence and a gate, you actually lock the gate. Right now, that doesn't mean they couldn't go over it, but if they have vehicles and they're trying to get their vehicles close to your house, it's more difficult to get through a locked gate than an unlocked gate, right? If you, so actual defense, if I have um, holly bushes under all of my windows all the way around my house, it makes it a lot harder to break a window and enter that way, right? If I fortify my front back doors, my main entry points into my house, and they try to kick the door in, but it won't kick in because it's been fortified, right? And there's inexpensive ways to do that. Then I've actually added a defensive measure. It's not just a deterrent. It's not just a don't come here. It's an actual defensive measure. And then the other active defensive measures are things like having weapons and knowing how to use them. Knowing how to defend yourself if you end up in a fight and you don't have your weapons on your person. And then adding things potentially like protection dogs into your program so that if somebody comes in, the protection dog is going to react way faster than I am. The protection dog, it, people are more afraid of dogs that will bite them than they are of people who will shoot them. And so that a dog actually engaging with a threat puts them on the defense and creates a lot of emotion in them. And it is something that even if, if people know that you have a dog, so a dog is another deterrent, right? If they know you have a dog and they decide to attack you anyway, if the dog actually engages, that changes because what they thought in their mind was they have a dog, but that dog's not going to do anything. The dog's going to run away. And people who are criminals are learning pretty quickly that most dogs won't do anything. If they come in and they're highly aggressive, most dogs will run away. I learned this when I was like 15. I started uh, running when I was 15. I was racing triathlons and things like that. I started cross country and all that. And I was running and we had a couple dogs on our street who um, were always in yards with fences, but the gates were always open, right? And when I would go running down the road, these dogs would always run out. And of course, I'm 15. I'm, I was afraid of these dogs. They were big dogs and they looked like they were going to bite me. And my dad told me, and my dad's not a particularly like aggressive person. In fact, he's very unaggressive. He's, uh, he's a Mr. Steady, right? He's a let's all be friends kind of a person. And he said, if a dog is running after you, stand your ground, yell back at it. Do not run. Do not back away. And so I started doing that. And these dogs, sure enough, now, some of them, you know, it, there was a standoff for some some periods of time sometimes. But if I didn't back off and I faced that dog and I yelled at that dog, get back, don't come any closer, things like that. And they saw there was an aggressive attitude toward me. They'd come running out woo, 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 and then they'd stop and they they wouldn't come in and actually engage. Right. And people figure this out pretty quickly. And that's having a gun with no bullets. And it, so if you have a dog and people decide I'm still coming in anyway, and your dog is not actually trained to engage, just like if you have a gun that's unloaded, or if you have a gun that you don't know how to use, right? You don't know how to fight with your gun, because there's a difference between going to a range and going pow, pow, pow. Now, under no stress, I'm going to take my magazine out. I'm out of ammo. I'm going to reload it. I'm going to put it back in, and I'm going to shoot again. That's one thing, right? And that's where most people are going to start if you've never learned how to use one before. But that's very different than combat reloads or reloading while in combat. So a combat reload is I entered a room, I used some of the ammo in my magazine, but I still have ammo in it, but it's not full, but there's a lull. And I usually you have a buddy or a partner who can guard a door entry. And I go, I'm going to combat reload. There's different ways you can communicate that. You usually don't just say those words. And you take the magazine out, but there's ammo in it. You don't want to get rid of it. So you grab another magazine that's full. You put that in the weapon and you save that ammo back in the pouch that you just removed your um, magazine from. And now I'm fully loaded again, right? So if we have another encounter, 
I'm not down all those rounds that I just had to use. Okay, so that's a combat reload. There's also a, I need to fire all the rounds that are in my magazine, slide lock to the rear. I have to drop that magazine and reload as quickly as possible and put my weapon back into action. That's a reload in combat, okay? And so if you've not trained to do that, and you have a gun, but you're not, you don't know how to really use it in combat. That's a tactical decision to make in advance. I'm going to go learn this skill, right? And if you can't make that decision or you won't make it, and if you, like, not everybody wants to go learn that stuff. Not everybody wants to put the time and energy into it, right? Then you need to make other tactical decisions that cover that gap in your capabilities, okay? So home evasion, we made ourselves a deterrent. We put actual defensive measures in place and there are reasonable fairly inexpensive things you could do and then you can go all out and have like a whole compound if you want to right but most people aren't going to set up a compound but it's a good idea to reinforce your door so that it can't be kicked in or it's much more difficult to kick in right it's a really good idea to do something to keep your windows from being used against you right if you're in florida most a lot of people put hurricane windows in place that's an option because you could throw things against a hurricane window and it's laminated and it's designed to take objects going at a hundred miles an hour and hitting the window and not smashing and, and actually crushing through and, and having an opening in the house, right? It's designed to take those impacts. So they're difficult to get into. You can do things like that and it's not terribly expensive and they have other benefits too, right? Like actually being hurricane proof if you live in a place where there's hurricanes or tornadoes. And so now we've taken actual defensive measures whatever is reasonable and, and you're willing to do. And then we go, now what am I going to do if three to five guys actually kick my front door in, right? And then you start asking questions like, if I have guns in the house, where are they? What status are they in? Do I just pick them up and pull a trigger and they, and they go boom? Or do I have to load them? And it depends on your state and your state laws. It depends on your comfort with these firearms. It depends on how old your children are and what have they been trained to do, right? If you have young children that have not been trained to leave guns alone, you don't want loaded guns that all you have to do is pull the trigger where children can reach them, right? So you have to make all these decisions. And then you go, okay, so this is my guns in a safe, let's say. Not necessarily the best tactical decision, but maybe the best decision to keep your kids from messing with the firearm. And so I go, okay, so it's in a safe. How long does it take me to get there? I'm sitting in my Lazy Boy recliner because this is where I sit when I watch TV. And boom, door gets kicked in and I get up to do something. Bless you, baby. I know, you're getting bored, but it's okay. Like, and I get up to respond to this and I decide I'm going for the weapon. How long does it take you to get there? Can you open it under stress? Once you have it, what are you going to do? Right? And then you go, hmm, yeah, it takes me about 45 seconds to a minute and a half to go get that gun and get back. Okay, uh, what if they tackle me to the ground while I'm trying to go get it? Well, what could I do about that? Right? What if um, they start shooting at me? What if they're grabbing my kids while I'm trying to run to another room? Right. Because one of the best tactics, if you are a bad guy and you're doing a home invasion, is they want to get into the house as quickly as possible. They want to get all of the people in the house subdued as quickly as possible. And then they can pretty much do whatever they want. Right. And so this is how these things happen. They're very quick. They're very violent and they happen very fast. And you have to be able to react to that. And so you need to start making decisions about how am I going to deal with that if it actually happens, right? Another situation you might find yourself in is some kind of a surprise attack. So this might be a woman walking through a dark uh, parking lot or a woman running on a trail somewhere and she runs on this trail every day at the same time because she, you know, she's got her schedule and she wakes up and she runs on this trail and some dude, some creeper starts watching her and he decides I'm going to hide in the bushes over there because that's a place where there's hardly anybody around and I'm going to grab her when she comes around the corner and drag her into the woods, right? That's a horrifying situation if you're a woman and you run in dark places early in the morning and there's spots like that on your running course, right? What are you going to do? How are you going to react to that? Are you going to carry a gun? Guns aren't easy to run with, even small ones. Are you going to carry a knife? Do you know how to use a knife? Are you going to run with a dog? Is your dog capable of defending you? But these are decisions that you think about and you make before the situation happens and then you start taking action to deal with them. Active shooter. Okay. This is one that a lot of people are afraid of right now because 
mass shootings happen, right? Generally, in an active shooter situation, they happen in crowded areas. And if you're not the one that's being immediately engaged, generally your best situation is to run, get away, get out of the area and get as far away from the threat as possible before that threat comes to you. Now, if you're a law enforcement officer or you carry concealed, or if your children maybe are near the threat and you're away from them, then you may decide I'm going toward the threat, right? But that is a situation, again, that we need to make in advance. And there's lots of things you can do in an active shooter situation. Doing some training is really good. Learn your options, right? It's run, hide, fight is generally what they say. So run away if possible. If you can't run away, hide. And if the person finds you, fight. And so, you know, in, in general terms, run, hide, fight is generally a good approach in an active shooter situation. Get away if possible. If not, hide so they can't find me. If they find me, fight with everything you have and use any weapons that you can in the area, right? Chairs, uh, fire extinguishers, anything you can find that elevates your strikes if you don't have firearms. Because in a school, you're probably not going to have firearms. At work, maybe you will, maybe you won't, depending on the situation. But again, don't wait until this situation happens and then go, oh, crap, what should I do? Think through these situations in advance make decisions in advance, and then take action so that the decisions you've made can actually be carried out in advance. And then domestic violence. This is one of the hardest ones because in domestic violence, sometimes you can run and escape, but generally evasion and escape looks more like get out of the relationship. And sometimes that's a lot easier said than done, right? But it is a situation where tactical decision-making is, in my opinion, the best way to work through the situation. Go talk to somebody. Who do you talk to? That's a tactical decision. Do I talk to the cops? What can the cops do? Do I talk to a counselor? Do I uh, talk to a friend, a family member, right? Who do I talk to that can actually help me deal with this situation? How do I get out of this situation in a way where my children stay safe? These are tough, hard decisions being in an environment where you're dealing with domestic violence is a tough decision. I almost made a dark joke there, but I decided it wasn't a good thing. I almost <laughs> said dealing with domestic violence situation like my wife has to. And I'm like, yeah, that's probably not a thing I should go into. That, that joke is a little too dark. But that is a bad situation to be in, right? It's a very, very tough situation to be in. But so is a home invasion. So is a direct attack. So is an active shooter. Anytime you're thinking about these things, they're tough. They're tough situations. There's, you're already in a situation where no decision you make is ideal. Every decision you make has trade-offs. And you have to start going through those and be honest with yourself and say, if I do this, what will happen? What's the most likely thing to happen? If I do that, what's the most likely thing that will happen? Of those two bad things, which is the better thing? Right? It's like choosing the, the lesser of two evils. Right? Because in any fight, the evil has already entered the, the equation. There's a fight. That means something bad is happening. And now I have to deal with it. Right, And if I can evade or escape, great. If I can de-escalate, great. And then if I have to fight, how do I fight so that it gives us the best chance for success based on the best goal, which is make our area safe again, either end the threat or get away from the threat. And we went longer than I thought we would tonight. So we're going to wrap it up with that. And uh, let me get over here. It looks like we've had a couple weeks off. So my YouTube comments are, I don't have any, um, which we usually have some. But I saw that it looked like there was at least one question over here. Gary said, can you touch on your philosophy on how and why your dogs fight the way they do? Um, okay, so we've talked about this in various different other places, but we generally take the approach that a personal protection dog is not a sport dog. Now, if you're into sport dogs, uh, people will generally get very upset with me when I say that. And, but let me explain why I think that way. Number one, sports were all of the sports that are out there, IPO, KMPV, Schutzen, all of the sports were designed to as a as a way of testing a dog at the end of its training to see if it was ready to go do its job well what jobs were they talking about military law enforcement and even the military 
It was almost always like whatever the version of military police were. So these were police dogs almost exclusively, right? What is the job of a police dog? The job of a police dog is to assist with apprehension. So when a police dog is biting, it's helping with apprehension. Now, what started happening is these dogs would bite somebody and then they would bite them again and they would bite them again. And then after the person was apprehended, they would sue the law enforcement agency and say, this was this was like way overboard, right? What do they call it? excessive violence, right? Excessive force. They they went way overboard. They shouldn't have hurt me this badly. And because dogs can cause a lot of damage. And uh, and so they said, well, what we want these dogs to do then is to bite one place and they pick places that are particularly painful, right? Sometimes it's a forearm, but they've often started getting into bicep bites because they hurt worse. Tricep bites or sometimes leg bites. And we want them to bite this one spot and then stay there. It creates a lot of pain. But if a person's running away, they probably don't want to fight. If a person is hiding, they probably don't want to fight. And that's what most people that get bit by police dogs are doing, running or hiding. And so they there's pain. And then the officer is able to come in and put handcuffs on that person and take them away. That's not what you're doing as an individual. If you need to use a dog to protect yourself as an individual, a person probably saw that you had a dog and then decided they were still going to attack you anyway. You're dealing with a significantly higher level of threat than a person who's running away from the cops, right? And so this person has already determined if that dog fights, I'm going to fight it. I'm going to be highly aggressive and I'm going to try and hurt that person or forcefully take something from them. And, and I have no qualms about hurting them in the process, even though they have an obviously trained dog. So our philosophy is our dogs are trained to fight human beings. That's how we deal with it. And if you're going to fight, have you ever seen a fighter in any fighting ring, right? Or even in any uh, YouTube video of a street fight who they what they did for the fight was they hugged the bad guy and they just held on to him, right? Now there's some guys who do, um, what is it? Br Brazilian jiu-jitsu and stuff like that, who put guys in different holds, right? And so they've been doing this. Uh, these videos have become a little bit more popular when people are doing shoplifting and things like that. But this isn't a person who was aggressively attacking that person in the first place. It was a dude who was just trying to shoplift and steal. And then somebody came up and restrained them forcefully until cops could come. Okay. If someone's attacking you, they are a very high level of threat, especially if you have a trained dog with you, because trained dogs are pretty obvious, right? They're walking at your side. They're not just running around on lead and doing random things. They're obviously trained and I'm attacking that person. That is a significantly higher threat. This person probably has a weapon. And if they have a weapon and the dog bites them and they haven't already presented the weapon, they're probably going to. So if a dog is biting and is biting and holding, and then the person draws a weapon, let's say it's a knife, and starts stabbing the dog, and the dog doesn't react to that weapon in their hand, then the dog's going to very quickly not be a tool for you to use anymore. And now it's out, it's been stabbed, it's bleeding out and dying, and now the person can come at you with this weapon, right? If the dog bites and I go to stab the dog and it releases and jumps back, just like any fighter will if they can, they dodge, they weave, they move out of the way, they block, right? The dog dodges out of the way, comes up and hits the arm with the weapon, starts ripping and tearing at this forearm, which causes them to drop the weapon. Now they can't use that weapon against me, right? So this is our philosophy on why our dogs reverse, is they're countering weapons. Even if somebody, if, if it's a big dude, Right. And a lot of the guys, the bad guys who are attacking people are bigger dudes because big dudes can fight people easier. Right. If you're a little dweeb, even if you're a bad guy, your your approach probably isn't go pick fights with people. You're probably going to take a different approach. If you're a bad guy and your approach is I'm going to beat the crap out of a person, it's probably because you're big and strong. And so a big, strong person that starts just beating the crap out of a dog. Dogs aren't impervious to being injured, right? They, you can knock a dog out. You can break an arm. You can injure their spine, right? So if all they're doing is sitting there and taking this beating, they can take a little bit more of a beating on their head than we can. They have pretty hard heads. But a big, strong dude is going to injure that dog pretty quickly. 
And so if all the dog's doing is biting and, and I've trained some of these dogs that have been started on sports and they've been started on this, the bite and hold approach. And then we start teaching them to reverse what they do in the beginning. When I come up to hit them in the head is they just close their eyes and take the hit. So you see it coming, you see their eyes look up, they see my arm come up like this and I come down and strike them and they just go <clears throat> and they just close their eyes and take the hit, right? If that's what they're doing when they're having the, the crap kicked out of them by a bad guy, they're gonna lose that fight, right? Now, it's better than nothing. It's like learning Taekwondo isn't very effective on the street, but it's better than nothing, or you've at least learned to take hits and, and to do some strikes. So that's pretty good. But learning how to actually fight for real with something like Shiv Works or places like that, right, where they're actually teaching you real world combative type training is way better than learning a sport. So sport fighting is better than learning no fighting. Sport, a sport trained dog is better than having no dog. But if you want a dog that's truly going to defend you in a bad situation, they should be able to move from man to man. They should be able to reverse and retarget weapon hands or not get continually struck, right? They should learn to counter and dogs do that various different ways. But a dog that bites and then jumps back and then flanks back and forth and circles around and then tags and then jumps back and then hits again and jumps back. That is a very effective fighting technique. People lose their minds when the dog's not running away, right? Because you can't turn your attention away from that dog. If that dog is flanking you and spinning around and biting you in the ass and biting you in the calf and then hitting your arm and then coming off and flanking around again, you if you turn your attention away, they're coming in and hitting you again. And so you, they can't focus on the person. They have to stay focused on the dog, which allows the person to do whatever they need to do. Maybe they come in and engage in the fight. Maybe they have children and they're going to run away while the dog stays engaged with this person. And then I can call the dog off from a distance or I can call in other help or various different things. Again, all tactical situations are a little bit different. So that's in a nutshell, our philosophy on why our dogs are trained to, to do what they do. And some people go, that makes sense to me. I want one of those dogs. And they come and they buy dogs from us or they come and train with us. Other people go, that sounds like a load of crap. I think the whole bite and hold thing is better. And they go train with those people. And that's great. Whatever approach you think is best is the approach you should go with. But I encourage you when you're talking to people, talk to people who have actually been in fights, military guys who have actually been in combat, law enforcement guys who have actually had to fight with people and have actually been in shootings. They generally, if you start pushing them, will start going, yeah, well, this might work in this situation, but it's probably not going to work in all these other situations. Nothing works in every situation. But we try to train our dogs to work in as many situations as possible and to have the ability to reason through and think and react and respond to a situation and not just go, oh, all I do is run in and bite the spot, right? Because that can work and it can help, but it's not your best option. There, there are, in our opinion, there are far better options and that's our approach there. So I hope that was helpful for you, Gary. Um, oh, we got a couple others. I so much agree with this statement, but man, it's hard to sell in the protection dog world. The protection dog world is dominated by sports and the self-defense world in general, shooting, um, martial arts and dogs, all of that, the whole spectrum of self-defense is a bunch of people who have never been in a fight, not a real fight. They might've been in like, you know, ring fights or sparring and stuff like that, but they've never been in a real fight. And they were trained by people who have never been in real fights and they're in their little box and their little box says, this is what we do in our little box. And then anything outside that box, they have no idea how to deal with it. That's why I go try to work with people who have been in real fights, especially people who have been in multiple real fights because they know better than almost anyone else. None of those fights were the same. They were all very different and we had to do different things in every situation. And if you're stuck into, I can only do this then that's a bad situation to be in if the thing you trained yourself to do isn't happening, right? The, the vision you had of whatever the bad guys were going to do, they're not doing it. They're doing something completely different. And then you're like, oh crap, what do I do now? I have no idea. And so I've been a contrarian from the very beginning and I really don't care what anybody else is doing. 
Uh, I care what we do and we do try to continually learn. I'm always watching other self-defense guys and seeing what are they doing? How are they reacting? How can I integrate a dog into that technique? And I don't go out and try and pick fights with people. I just do what I do. And everything, every fight that I've been in with people, you know, the online type fighting, right? The, you know, making comments back and forth. I don't even engage in it anymore. If it's an actual question, like what you just asked, I give my opinion and I move on. If they start, you know, trolling and all that, I just block, delete comment and move on with my life. I don't care anymore. I don't care what other people do. Um, but when they have an actual, like if they want an actual conversation, I'm happy to have it. What I found is every time we start to have this actual conversation, uh, all they can do is yell. Like they don't have answers to these questions. How do you deal with your dog being stabbed? Well, we don't do it the way you do it. Well, what do you do? Basically, they have no answer. They do nothing. That's what they do. And so what what happens if somebody pulls out a knife? Their dog gets stabbed to death. That's what happens, right? Because they've not d trained their dog to deal with it because they don't know how. And I, I was blessed to, I, I never had to deal with that part of the dog world. I learned the way that I learned. And that was all I knew for a long time. And then when I was exposed to the sport world, I'm like, what the heck is this? Like, okay, like it, it looks cool on a video, but it has no real world application because I was in the army, actively deploying Afghanistan, Iraq, that kind of stuff, and learning to train dogs from a guy who had been a MACV SOG veteran in Vietnam. And that's how I learned to train dogs. And so I was just like, okay, like that makes way more sense. Because anytime we deal with these people who are doing bite and hold and stuff, we go, well, what about this? What about that? What about this? And no answers. They don't, they just don't have answers to these questions. Um, so I had a pretty intense argument with my own trainer about the style of the dogs fighting. It's hard to find people who will do this. And arguing can sometimes work, but a lot of times the best thing to do is just go, will you do this for me? If the answer is no, like I have people that go, I only want bite and hold. Or, or like people will come and train with us and they don't train with us a lot. They're just like, hey, can I come show up and do some training with you? And I'm like, sure, show up and do some training with us. And they've trained their dogs in bite and hold. And I go, do you want me to teach your dog to reverse? And they go, no, I do IPO. I go, okay. Like, if you don't want your dog to reverse, I'm not going to force you to do it my way. Like, it's easy. I take a bite off your dog. What do you want me to do? Okay, I'll do that. And had fun with you, man have a great life, go do your thing, right? And so if your trainer's open to that, I, I don't care about sports. I want you to teach my dog to reverse if they know how, which if you're starting a dog, it's not hard to, to start a dog that way. They actually will do it very naturally. It's um, it's if your dog's already been trained to do the bite and hold, it can sometimes be hard to, to transition them into now reversing because they've, they've been locked into a thing. But most of the time, rather than fighting, it's better just to ask if they will do a thing. And if they say no, then I just go, okay, I'll call around and see if I can find somebody that will train the way I want. We do, if you're interested, Gary, uh, do three to five day uh, protection training intensives. And so I've got clients who come every about, about every three months. And you know, I, I usually tell them it's about three to five sessions usually to get your dog fully spun up and what we do. And some of them do the three to five sessions and then they're like, thanks, I appreciate it. And they live their lives and other people just get into it like I do. And they're like, they just keep coming year after year after year. So um, that's an option. If you're interested, you can send me a text 813-836-9244. Uh, can you put that in the comments real quick, babe? Just because so, I know if he wasn't looking at something to write, uh, he might not have that. And uh, Tracy said, bite and hold is great until they stand there and get stabbed to death because they don't know any better. That's exactly right, Tracy. And uh, so, yep, I hope that helped, Gary. Um, you know, it, the other thing that we started doing, the, the one downside to my mentor was, I, I didn't know these terms at the time, but they, they had the poverty mindset. The poverty mindset in business is this. If somebody else is successful, they're going to take my business, right? And... I had that mindset for a long time when I started. And so when people wanted to learn, I'd be like, well, you have to sign this like no compete clause and do all this stuff. And if you want to train, you have to do it under me and blah, blah, because that's how my mentor had been. And then I realized, you know what, if we actually do want to change the dog world, if we actually want more people to adopt the approach that we're taking, because we think it's the best approach, then what we need to do is be open and work with people and then let them go and do their version of it. 
And, uh, and so we've taken that approach much more. Uh, we work with people, uh, they come in, we train them, we put them to work here. So I get a benefit of them being extra hands on the, the dog stead and they get the benefit of learning as they work. And, uh, and then they can go and do whatever they want to with that. And hopefully it, it makes a difference and hopefully it makes the dog world better. Um, Ori said, how do people keep up the protection training after doing the in-person sessions with you? Does the owner have a bite helper at home they practice with? So in general, dogs, once they've been trained to do bite work, they generally don't lose it too much. What, what they do lose is this. If you've ever gone and trained uh, to do some fighting, right? When you first, the first time you get punched in the face, it, it totally disorients you, right? If you've never been punched in the face before, when you get punched, especially if you're not used to getting punched, you see actual stars, right? They're not like cartoon stars. They're like flashes of light all over, right? You see that. Generally, if you were looking at the person, the first thing that happens is you're looking at the ceiling or the sky, right? And then you're, you're doing that. And then you, you look back down and you get hit again. And it's like sky, face, sky, face, stars, and then you fall over, right? And so um, that's what happens the first couple of times you get hit. But then you start fighting and you start getting used to taking some hits and you start getting used to doing some things. You start getting used to, to wrestling. And all of a sudden that stuff's not as stressful anymore. So now maybe my coach was talking to me before and I couldn't hear him because all I could see was stars and getting hit in the face. But now that I'm used to doing the, the physical part of it, I can hear my coach talking. I can hear other people talking. I can be more aware of my surroundings because I can deal with the stress better. Then if I don't fight for a couple of years, when I go back and do it again, all of a sudden I'm not as good as I was, right? I've, I've lost a little bit of my ability to deal with stress, but I'm way better than if I hadn't done anything and I can get it back pretty fast. The, so the dogs will lose a little bit of that if they don't fight. And so sometimes auditory exclusion is probably the most common one. And so I tell people the main thing you lose if you haven't done bite work with your dog in a while is the out because they literally don't hear you right? They haven't been in a fight in a while. Now they're back in a fight for real, or they're actually like, they're either back in a fight in training or they're, they're actually defending you and you haven't done it in a while. They'll go in and engage, but they're auditory exclusion right now. And they don't hear you. Like you're yelling and they're just like, I'm focused on what I'm doing. And so uh, the out will suffer a little bit. And sometimes the speed will suffer a little bit. So in general, we, we recommend at least a annual retraining. Um, some people do it. Some people don't. It's up to each person. But if you do annual retraining, you get a lot out of it. Um, Semi-annual is even better. You don't have to do quarterly. Our first year, we recommend quarterly. For our warranty, we require quarterly um, in the first year because that first year is when you're making all your mistakes. And so if I see you every three months while you're making all your mistakes, I can help you fix your mistakes so that you're good to go. But, the, um, but in terms of just maintaining the bite work, at least once a year is ideal. Um, if you can do it twice a year, that's even better. Most people don't know how to take bites from their own dog and maintain their dog. So in general, it's not a good idea. In general, if you if you want to do our type of training and our type of fighting and you go to your typical person that may be local to you, um, probably they're just going to try and train your dog into the bite and hold. And so you're going to lose a lot of the ability of the reversing. Now, some dogs just won't stop it once they figure it out. They're not going to stop. But there are ways of, of reinforcing the bite and hold, just like there are ways of reinforcing the reverse. That's what we call retargeting on the arms. And, um, and so you can lose some of that reversing if you train with the wrong people. So, you know, coming to us once a year, I actually, uh, I mentioned Taylor at the beginning of this. If Taylor decides to stay on with us long term, um, we might have somebody who can travel again, because I don't travel anymore. I'm like, nope, I go to events uh, to as an advertising type of thing for the business. And that's it. I don't travel to deliver dogs. I don't travel for retraining. People come to me. Um, but if I can get somebody that I can train up and that will travel, that would be a big benefit to people. And of course, as soon as this started, all of the comments started coming in like crazy. So let me see if I can catch up here real quick. Um, so I hope that answered your question, uh, Ori. Uh, Tracy said, didn't know like three days in a row was an option. I might have to take that up. Yeah. So, uh, just full disclosure, our three day training is $1,500. Our five day training is 2000. So if you decide to do the full five days, basically you get one day for free. Um, but it's $500 a day is, you know, and if you do a full five days, 
you pay for four days. And uh, that's definitely an option. So um, people can come in and do that. I have several clients uh, who are doing that currently, like every about, about every three months. Uh, they show up, they train with me for three to five days. Most of them are doing five days because it's a better deal. And if you're already traveling, you might as well save those extra two days. And uh, and we we work with that. Uh, Coleman said, I'm not married to the bite and hold, but I do prefer the full mouth bite. Yeah. So here's our idea on the full mouth bite. So when a, there, there's a couple different thoughts on this, right? And what I don't like a dog to do is be right on the tip of the material, right? And so I don't want the dog avoiding the arm and just staying on the tip of the material because in real life, that's going to do minimal damage, right? I want the dog getting enough in because when I'm doing bite work with a dog, I can't just go, here's my arm, rip it to shreds, right? Because that I'd be a really short-term trainer if I did that. So I have to put something on that keeps me from being injured while I'm allowing a dog to use its teeth to rip and tear. And so I want the dog digging enough that it's actually getting a getting muscle, right? Now, what a dog, what usually happens with the full mouth bite is they are typically, not always, but typically training those dogs to drive in to the bite, right? And so if a dog bites me and drives in, but it's trained to reverse, it can still be an effective fighter. Okay. But what it's not doing is it's not ripping. Let's see if I get my arm where both can see. It's not ripping through this forearm and causing me to lose function of my hands. Okay. Now, some people prefer that because they go, well, too much damage. I might get sued. Right. Well, if you have to defend yourself, you're probably getting sued. So it might be a good idea to join something like U.S. Law Shields so that you pay 120 bucks a year and they come and defend you for the hundred thousand dollar lawsuit that you have to deal with. Right. But so if the dog's been trained to drive in, right, it's still painful. If it will reverse while driving in, it, it is still effective against weapons, but it's not actually making your hands non-functional. What is the threat on a human? If I'm going to hurt you, how do I do it? I do it right here, my hands, right? If you're on audio only, you don't see me wiggling all my fingers. If I'm going to choke you, I do it with my hands. If I'm going to stab you, I do it with my hands. If I'm going to use a gun, I do it with my hands, right? If I'm going to clinch and choke you out this way, I'm going to do it with my hands. I need my hands if I'm going to hurt you. If I take these from you, it's not that you can't hurt me, right? If you're a Muay Thai fighter and you're really good at leg strikes, you could still hurt me, but your ability to hurt me has been significantly declined if I take your ability to, to use these away, right? Pain when I have a lot of adrenaline, as soon as it's gone, I still have full function. Ripping those muscles and tendons and ligaments to pieces physically makes your hands floppy, useless things, right? And so that's why in general, I go, I do like a deeper bite than a shallow bite if the shallow bite's not effective. But what I want is canines, right? We call the dog a canine because it has canines these four small knives in its mouth that it sinks in and if we let it bite naturally what will it do it will sink in and it will thrash and pull back and rip that muscle and skin and ligaments and tendons and then if the dog has been trained to reverse as soon as it's through that it hits again and it hits again right it might be other arms as i'm trying to strike the dog and fight with it but it's hitting and thrashing through and hitting and thrashing through so if the dog's been trained on a full mouth bite to drive in it's not doing that if it's been trained to to bite and thrash and rip then a full mouth bite is a little bit more effective right so it's it's all like generally my my approach to the bite work is this i let the dog fight how it fights naturally as long as the natural fight is effective, right? So what I do with the dogs is I don't so much teach them, do this, do that, do this. I go, start biting me. Okay, you're biting me. What if I hit you, right? So the first time I introduce a dog to reverse, I just slowly come down and I go, what are you gonna do about this? And if they jump up and hit my other arm, I, I basically reward them by not hitting them again, right? And then it gets a little harder and a little harder. And I go, what are you gonna do about this training knife? Nothing, whack in the ribs. That hurt, didn't it? Might want to do something about this. 
And then I do something like, hey, there's a car right there. You're biting me. I'm going to pin you against the tire and choke you out with my leg. Oh, you didn't like that? Might want to do something about it. And I let them figure out what they're going to do about it. And as long as whatever they do is effective, then I just let them keep working. Right. So almost all of my dogs fight slightly differently. I don't teach them to do a thing. I go, what are you going to do about this? That works. Now, maybe there's this weakness. What are you going to do about that? Oh, good job. That works too. Right. What's not acceptable is to run away or stop fighting. Right. As long as they stay in the fight and whatever they're doing to counter is effective, then I let that dog do that thing to counter. And that's been our general ap approach. So, and that's nothing against the deep mouth. Deep mouth bites aren't bad. It's just, if that's the full focus, you can lose a lot of other things. Um, scrolling through, scrolling through. While decoying, I felt the difference in the pushing bite sucks. It, it, so a pushing bite does suck a little bit more when you're in a suit. Absolutely. I'm not taking that away. Um, and that's the whole point of it, right? The reason they use a deep mouth bite is because they're, they have more leverage deeper back on their molars, right? And so they can put more pressure in. And when you're in a suit that stops penetration and puncturing from their canines when they thrash, there is more pain. That's, I will 100% give you that. A deep mouth bite is more painful in the initial pressure, right? Which is why I tell my, my new canine sparring partners when they're starting with me, you better freaking flex that muscle clench that fist as tight as you can. Cause if you're loose and floppy and they bite and your, your muscle is soft, you're going to be in some hurt in world, right? If you clench down, it still hurts, but it hurts less. So a full mouth bite does hurt more for sure, but it doesn't cause as much damage. And that's the difference. It hurts more, which is why it's, it's effective for apprehension. It's very effective for apprehension, which is why law enforcement likes it causes less damage and it's good for apprehension. But if the person's actually a threat with weapons, there can be a downside to it. And, and again, it's number one, there's no single answer that solves every problem. That's extremely important to, to remember. Number two, every person needs to, to have their own approach. Just because something works for me doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Right. I just go, this is why we do what we do. There might be a better way to do it. There might be especially for certain people, there might be a more effective approach for other people and their approach to how they're going to defend themselves. But if you connect with our approach, then get a dog from us. If you connect with somebody else's approach, go get a dog from them. Right. So um, I love the question, Coleman. Don't take anything I've said. Coleman got, I think you still have one of my dogs and, uh, and Coleman's a great guy. Right. So none of this is like, I get excited about it because it's something I'm passionate about, but none of this is like having an issue with Coleman. I think he's awesome. And, uh, and I've seen some of your stuff online and you're doing a great job, but it's just, these are, this is the rationale as to why we do what we do versus why other people do what they do and why I choose to focus on certain things versus other things is I just think it's more effective in the real world application. So it is important to remember when you're doing bite work with equipment on when the dog thrashes, they're pulling against material that's been designed not to tear right? That's why bite suit material is made out of the material it's made out of because dogs are going to bite it and we don't want it to rip up and tear uh, too quickly. And, uh, but when you don't have that on, what happens then? What's going on when there's an actual situation and my dog's actually biting, you know, a person's actual arm, what, what is it then? How does it affect that situation? And so it, sometimes we can forget about that when we're doing the bite work. All right. I think that's all of them. And we're already over an hour and a half. John Rice, good to see you on YouTube. All right, guys, we're going to wrap it up. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, remember, if you like our content, would like to support us, give us a thumbs up, subscribe, and share our stuff on whatever social media platform you're hearing this on. Don't forget to follow me on Noster or listen on Fountain if you're doing audio only. And you can share zaps or boosts with us and give me Bitcoin because I love Bitcoin. Um, don't forget to check out and share our websites, FortressK9.com and K9Academy.us. If you'd like to contact me, you can tell me I suck. You can ask me to talk about a specific topic, or you can just ask a question. You can do that on email at Joel, J-O-E-L at FortressK9.com, or you can send me a text. Do not call me, but you can send me a text at 813-836-9244. I currently have eight voicemails. I did 10. I have eight voicemails and I haven't checked them yet. And I keep thinking I should check my voicemails. And you know what? This is what happens. So don't call me. 
send me a text. You'll get a way faster response. All right, guys, don't forget to follow us on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Truth Social, Gab, Freesteading, and Noster. We are at Fortress K9 just about everywhere. Facebook's a little different because I got hacked about a year and a half ago. That's at Fortress K9 Kennels. Do all the things. Don't forget to follow at K9 Philosophy and at Mountain Vista K9. They're both working with our dogs and doing great things as well. And I will see you guys next week. Remember, next week's going to be a pre-recorded. I'll be back live the week after that. At least that's the plan, uh, assuming that we get recovered quick enough. As always, remember, until next time, train hard and stay safe. Fortress Canine Podcast.